Hello everyone. Welcome to the Net Zero Energy Building Knowledge Series. This is a platform for industry experts to share their expertise, knowledge, showcase projects, products, technology, and even share ideas to grow engagements for net zero energy buildings in India. This initiative is supported by the METRI program funded by USAID. METRI is an acronym for Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. You can learn more about this program uh, on our website, metri.edsglobal.com. Myself, I am uh, Deepa. I'm an architect and a green building consultant at Environmental Design Solutions. I'll be the session moderator today, and I'm joined by my colleague Prachi. She is coordinating the session today. So today we're going to talk about outdoor thermal comfort. Now the words outdoor and thermal comfort don't necessarily go together. At least that's what I used to think. The typical approach is to be indoors, right? To feel comfortable. But in times of global warming, Outdoor comfort is becoming an important factor for livability and well being of human habitat. So, the area immediately outside the building is often ignored, other than some maybe landscape interventions. But it turns out that good passive design strategies can make a big difference in determining if an outdoor space feels comfortable or not. It also determines how much and how often is the outdoor space really used. So this is one area where active systems have only a limited range of application. Let's hear more on this topic from our expert speaker for today, Alexander. He is joining us from Unique in Germany. Alex is a climate design engineer at TransSolar Climate climate engineering. His approach to the different projects is based on his architectural understanding in combination with energy efficiency and sustainable design. He has been involved in the development and implementation of innovative climate and outdoor comfort concepts. He works on daylight and passive house calculations, focusing on holistic process. He's going to share some interesting examples, um, case studies to show exactly how effective some of the design interventions can be to enhance outdoor thermal comfort. So with this, I uh, welcome you, Alex, to the webinar today and over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Deepa, for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and um, welcome you from Munich. And good afternoon to India, especially. Um, I hope you have better outdoor comfort than we have. It's very <laughs> cold and stormy, so no chance here for outdoor comfort. But um, anyway, I want to explain, uh, tell you a bit about auto comfort, designing for auto thermal comfort. What we do often in the office at Transolar in Munich and um, basically what are the strategies and what's the difference to what we, most of us better know is indoor comfort. So um, let me start with the uh, two pictures, which uh, infrared images which are on the same location. They are 30 meters apart from each other. It was at the Expo 2015 in Milan, in Italy, at the Austrian Pavilion. And you see two environments um, with the same air temperature, but two very different comfort perceptions. On the left, it was a colleague of me 
you see he's surrounded by surface temperatures which are all hotter than himself and on the right picture this was inside the pavilion you see um, a lot of vegetation and the sky which was me is surrounded by surface temperatures which are all colder than body the human body so can imagine this person on the right he was really can release heat from his body to the environment whereas the left one um, gets emissions heat emissions and uh, is check the balance so it is auto comfort is not about air temperatures about designing the environments right you can see it you can do it pretty different and how you design it has a big impact on the comfort so what is comfort especially what is outdoor comfort and you pretty much know all of you the definition by ashri which expresses it, expresses it as a satisfaction with a thermal environment so this sounds pretty neutral and i like to better explain it to you in um, some pictures we can see this is um, different climates different climate zones and they all people that you see they they feel comfortable and from saudi arabia madrid milan singapore in front of this adiabatic cooling in munich exposed to the sun and in innsbruck in the winter even more exposed to sun you see these people they all feel comfortable and it's not a matter of temperature because air temperature in this case is between zero and probably 40 degrees it's a matter of how you design the environment so if it's comfortable or not so basically auto comfort can be expressed or evaluated in an index called UTCI, it's the Universal Thermal Climate Index, which puts not only air temperature, but also the other relevant factors which influence auto comfort, which is especially solar radiation and infrared radiation. So the top one, together they form the mean radiant temperature, the MRT, which um, will be important in the next, ses the next slides but also air humidity, air velocity, clothing factor, and metabolic rate is included. And all these together are expressed in the UTCI, which behind this UTCI index, there's this um, biometrical model of the human body, which um, expresses at the end the comfort perception in one number, which is uh, like a temperature and it can be very it can be classified into different ranges so the utci says between 9 and 26 the green range this is no thermal stress whereas the orange or the yellow one is moderate heat stress red is strong heat stress and so on so this is to simplify uh, the evaluation of auto comfort because you can express it in one number but behind is always the sole metrics and in contrast to indoor comfort where we control uh, the room condition to a certain set point for example 24 degrees outdoor comfort or the outdoor conditions cannot be controlled to a set point because it's so fluctuant and you can't use just air conditioning to have a certain air temperature it's just not possible it's so the goal is always to reduce heat stress or cold stress and get to the let's say the green range in the UTCI so it's not always you cannot target one number target is always to reduce as, mu as much as possible so I quickly show you an example for how these different strategies could look like this is this person is standing in the sun at an air temperature around 30 degrees, humidity around 17 gram per kilogram. And you see it's a pretty high mean radiant temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius because he's um, exposed to solar radiation. There's no wind and he's a typical clothing and it's walking. 
So the, the corresponding UTCI is around 37 degrees. If this guy is now walking in the shade, and you see the only thing that changes is the MRT, it's reduced significantly. It already reduces the UTCI by around four degrees. And if this guy now is walking in a breeze, so he has some wind, then this also reduces the UTCI by another four degrees around. So this all they have the same air temperature, but you see the UTCI range is around eight degree already. And now if you add some adiabatic cooling, which means you reduce the air temperature slightly by adding some humidity and some combination with elevated airspeed, you get another reduction in the UTCI of another four degrees. So this just shows we don't vary the air temperature too much, but we can have a effect on comfort with other because air temperature is hard to handle outdoors. So I show you in this case a project an example of us, of this um, adiabatic cooling, what we call dry mist. We tested it in Singapore Zoo. So that climate is always its local identity because you cannot just, for each climate, there's different strategies that works. And we always start when we look into outdoor comfort with analyzing the climate. And of course, in Singapore, it's uh, pretty easy because it's more or less the, the whole year, it's the same climate. So air temperatures around 30, 32 during the day and pretty stable high humidity of around 20 gram per kilogram. So if you put all the hours of the Singapore climate into a psychrometric chart. But you know, you know, all know this, it's ambient temperature versus humidity ratio. And the outdoor conditions of Singapore, each hour is one little cross here. They are this cloud, this is the whole year. And now you can overlay this with a comfort perception. We have you know, the MRT, the wind velocity, the clothing and metabolic rate, then you can overlay these temperatures with a comfort range and see, okay, with this temperature and humidity ranges, they are in the uncomfortable warm range. See if this person is in the, sh in, in the sun. Same for slightly warm conditions and comfortable conditions. You see Singapore climate in the sun is not very comfortable. I'm sure you know this from your own experience. Auto comfort in this term is of course bad. So now what happens if I change the boundary conditions and say this person is now in the shade and I just go back and forth a bit. So you see the comfort ranges, they are shifting to the right. We get same air temperature, same humidity conditions, we get uh, different comfort perceptions because we can shift the comfort range. And if we add a breeze, can even shift it more. So now we are already in a, say, pretty good condition that we have some hours in the years already in the green range and some are in the um, yellow range the moderate heat stress. So pretty good already, but now if we add some adiabatic cooling, which means we move the points from around the entropy line to the left towards 100% um, humidity, this means we can move further points now from the yellow range into the green range, and from the red into the yellow range. So this now is um, what we did in the Singapore Zoo. We did test this adiabatic cooling, even if it is already pretty humid there, but we have still can see by this evaluation that it's 
good method to further increase comfort. So this um, shows a bit more detail what is evaporative cooling. Basically, it, it take one point, you add humidity by spraying water into the air, and the point moves along this enthalpy line, which is um, more or less the energy sum of this air humidity mix stays the same. But while it gets more humidity, it cools down. So in terms of comfort, this means you can uh, shift points into another comfort range. And we call this dry mist because um, it, there's a difference between typical misting, what I'm sure you all know from somewhere where um, just spray water into the air and the effect is that somehow it gets colder but it also gets sticky and you get wet when you are in front of these systems and if you further develop this it can be a really good system we call dry mist it's um, a combination of special nozzles and a high pressure system which creates droplets that are so small that they evaporate in the air within one or one half and a half meters. So at the end, you get the evaporative cooling effect, but you don't get wet. That's the big difference of, say, a uh, high technology misting system, which is you don't get wet when you stand in front of it in, a, in the, let's say, most conventional misting systems where you just spray water into the air and somehow doesn't evaporate quickly and efficiently. So, and if you see this, another important factor, of course, is that you add some elevated airspeed to this. So the combined effect creates a big impact on UTCI. And we tested this in the Singapore Zoo. And you see on the left, we have um, measurement station in the sun somewhere on the pathway. And the UTCI, the corresponding was around 37 degrees UTCI almost. So moving this station to the shade, we proved the UTCI to about 32. And on the pathway where we installed the prototypes of this dry mist systems, we had around 33 degrees, like not in front of the dry mist, but as a reference. And in front of the dry mist systems, we could reduce UTCI to 27 or directly in front of it to 20, around 26 degrees UTCI. So significant reduction. We could measure in numbers, but more important was um, than the measurement in numbers was the measurement in reactions of the people. And there's a video on, on I think on YouTube, you can find it or on the homepage. It shows the reaction of the peoples in on this pathway. And it's really nice because you can see them walking on this pathway and then they stopped when they came into this range of the dry mist systems and just enjoyed the cool breeze that they got there. So this was more important for us to see than the numbers we could get out of, out of the measurement stations because they qualified somehow what we are, the number crunching we are doing before and after this. So second project, we uh, used this kind of system and strategy was the Austrian pavilion at the Expo 2015. I just I showed you a picture at the beginning and this was in Milan in Italy. So also hot climate, we had a hot summer there, but it was not that humid. So the systems were even more efficient. And the idea of the pavilion was mainly outdoor comfort. So it was, the idea was to get the climate of an, a performance of a dense Austrian forest into the climate of Milan. And if you see, to get a performance of a forest, 
which needs around 3.1 hectare to create this microclimate inside into a little box in the pavilion in 560 square meters we of course we added some um, artificial boost kind of misting so this was the idea of the pavilion you see we had a lot of plants of course in there it should look like a forest it should feel like a forest we also artificially boosted uh, the climate performance with this dry mist systems and some fog nozzles and at the entrance we had some fox deers and the box is open at the top and in the bottom so it's really outdoors kind of it's protected but it's outdoors and we covered this also with pv to um, be self-sufficient with an in terms of energy so now i should first show you the reactions of people and we somehow benefited from a really hot summer in Milan. They were walking outside the expo at the main area of the expo and the truth was really hot and they came into the pavilion. This is after the entrance and they first did what they did. They, they cooled down their body in this nice cold climate. Lisa group standing in front of a dry mist systems, which now look like more like a conventional fan, which were integrated into the landscapes. And people um, enjoying the, just enjoying the, the climate inside on some benches. So the picture showing before, was before the opening. It just shows how we somehow integrated uh, the dry mist systems, the artificial part of this installation into the landscape. And now I'm going to show you a bit the evaluation. This is what we did before or while planning this, before building it. We took the climate of Milan and said, okay, there's on the main pathway, the UTCI during the operation time in Milan, the whole summer, it will be 40% in this excellent range, 26% in this moderate range, and everything above will be too hot. So inside with the good shading, we can um, improve this to around 80% an excellent range and in this rich Austrian forest climate it's number three we can even boost this to more than 90 percent times with excellent comfort and while this expo while opening we did some measurements of course again and I show you some results from a really hot day where we had 35 degrees outdoor air temperature, July. And on position number one, you see this is the main pathway of the expo. In the shade, we have a UTCI of around 36 degrees. On position two, it was inside the pavilion, not in front of the adiabatic cooling, but just inside the pavilion, we had around 33 degrees UTCI, and this was, if you check numbers down there, it was mainly because of the MRT was reduced, because we have a much better shading by vegetation and the structure. They ex will explain this later also in a bit more detail. But in position number three, you see in front of these dry mists, we had um, another reduction of of um, UTCI in around six degrees because we had this adiabatic cooling there. And we get, on this day, we could not get, get into the green range. It was too hot, but this was not our target and this was not the target of um, comfort because you see the reduction from 36 degrees to 27 is around eight degrees 
reduction in UTCI. And this is what, if you are outdoors and you walk into this pavilion, you feel it feels just cold. No matter if it's in green rains or yellow rains, the reduction by itself is already making you much more comfortable. So we also measured this in April and it was a moderate day. And we could even get a reduction of around 10 degrees UTCI in the pavilion. So not the dry mist and the misting was not the only thing that created this good performance. It was also the, the, the surrounding, the vegetation. You see here, this is the entrance of the pavilion with, where we had some ground fog. Let's say we missed it. We did some misting in the ground area. This is the infrared image. And you see all the surfaces at the bottom in the strains of the misting, the vegetation is close to dew point. It's really much colder than the persons which are walking in there. But what is also important is the temperatures of the leaves above. They are, let's say, close to air temperature, which is a really good performance in terms of shading. Like artificial shading structures, they always tend to be much higher than air temperature. I will show you later some images. But this was really like a cool pool we created here for people. And you see this significant difference in performance of materials also outside of the pavilion. We see this is a vegetation, like a plot of vegetation, which somehow the surface temperatures are around air temperatures. This is what plants tend to do a bit lower if you have some misting like at the bottom but then compared to artificial materials like the wooden dark painted bench and the dark asphalt it's much it's there's a big difference in performances around 10 to 20 degrees lower surface temperatures just by appropriate material selection so I think now there's a quiz coming. So yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Alex. That was very insightful and uh, interesting case studies that you just shared. I mean, especially the dry mist. It's so counterintuitive to think that humidity, adding humidity to an already humid climate, would only make things, uh, you know, uncomfortable. But turns out that's not the case. Uh, because because of the physics that you just uh, explained. And I think this reduction from 36 to 27 is phenomenal for a equatorial um, kind of climate. So yes, we have a few questions here, just yeah. to have a little fun and uh, to engage all the uh, attendees uh, as well. So we have a poll and there's a question now coming up on your screen. And you can give in your vote, um, select the right answer. The question is, what is UTCI? Uh, this has been now discussed pretty much on every slide. So hope uh, the C part of it has been captured correctly. So <laughs> beginning it <laughs> also <laughs> votes uh, coming in maybe uh, uh, six, seven more seconds, and that will complete 30 seconds. and. Um, uh, well, pretty interesting. Uh, <laughs> and okay, so we close it now, and I will uh, show you the answer. Share. There you go. What is UTCI? Uh, Universal Thermal Comfort Index. That's what majority of the attendees are saying. Whereas it is Universal Thermal Climate Index. Right, mm -hmm. Alex. Very confusing. Yeah. I always, and, I always confuse these two guys. Yeah. Intuitively, we may think it's comfort because we are talking about comfort, but no, it's climate index. So just something to be aware of that it's uh, UTCI is climate index. Um, of course, it is talking about comfort, but on the outdoors. Uh, now coming up, the second question. 
on your screen. What is the desired UTC I for hot climate? Less than so these are temperatures, which is um, actually uh, index, right? So it kind of talks about temperatures less than 40, 35, 32, 30. Um, maybe we didn't discuss very explicitly on this, but I think it's since you've given more or less examples of hot and dry, I mean hot and humid uh, climate, this one could take a best guess on this. So mm -hmm. I'd encourage everybody to take a best guess. All right, 30 seconds over. We close it now and uh, let me share the results. Okay. So, 37, like most of them are saying less than 30, majority, and then followed by 32. Um, as far as we understand, it's less, anything less than 32 is great for a hot climate, right? Yeah, it depends very much where you come from, but if you're already in a hot climate, then Below 32 is excellent already. It's not does not always have to be in the green range. What I showed, it's if you are in hot climate, the yellow range is pretty good already. Yeah. That, that is actually a very good point because not always we can aim for the green area because yeah. the outer temperatures could be 40, 45, could be more. And so as long as and even if you get a 10 degree difference, and even if it is in the 30s. Uh, temperature range, it's, it's still really good. Yes, exactly. It's often only about this reduction. If you have a reduction of eight or nine degrees, doesn't matter where you end, it feels good. Right. So, so again, that kind of takes the focus onto the aspect that absolute temperature is not really a big indicator of comfort. As long as you are more or less in the range, yeah. it's um, you know, it can be called as comfortable, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on. At this point, I'd just like to remind everyone, if you have questions, please start sending them to us in the chat box. So we start taking them towards the end of the session. And we always get a feedback that you've not taken all the questions. We like to do that. So there is enough time and the questions are coming in well in advance. So please try and uh, do so. All right, thank you. And uh, Alex, you, over to you. Okay, thanks. So. So, thank you, Deepa, for this interesting question. Um, I would like to continue now with um, a bit more urban approach. It's about pedestrian comfort and some project examples in Abu Dhabi and Master City. So, I think you know Abu Dhabi, how it looks like. It's pretty, um, looks like more or less a sometimes a copy of um, New York or Western cities. It's very exposed to sun. There's not a lot of vegetation and there are only hard surfaces. So if you take an infrared image, you see that the city, the surface is heat up. They are all above air temperature and the radiant temperature here is around 48 degrees, so much higher than air temperature. And we did a project together with Foster and Partners um, called Master City, which is um, kind of a suburb of Abu Dhabi, same climate. And it should be a CO2 neutral city with uh, elements of like reinventing a uh, city in the desert, also in terms of outdoor comfort. And you see, this is a part which is built, it's a university part and it goes back to the uh, traditions of having the narrow streets and what you see in, in ancient desert cities and this is not it is not because of nothing it is a, has a big effect on, on comfort and on livability in these cities and you see 
here in this tweet an infrared image which shows all the surface temperatures are below air temperature. So the radiant temperature is, is close or even a bit below air temperature. Just by having a appropriate answer for um, city design and just by just by designing it right, let's say. Uh, we were also there and took some measurements and you see this courtyard, which you see in the pictures already, it, it looks somehow more comfortable than the streets, the open streets in Abu Dhabi and people like to relax there. And we measure it with a simple infrared thermometer, radiant temperatures of surfaces in the sun. They are around 48. Radiant temperatures in um, if surfaces in the shade, so around 34, they are around air temperature, let's say. And we also measured uh, radiant temperature of the sky. You can see the sky temperature is minus 3.6 degrees. So in the hot desert climate, this is the best cooling source you can have. And this gives this. Um, this is now the topic of the next chapter, let's say. It's about shading and sky cooling, and especially in, in hot climates. Because this was a competition also for Master City, for the main plaza we did with lava. And in comparison to the dense streets, which are a typical part of the strategy in the, in the city, we proposed a really open plaza for the center, which has this operable umbrellas. And they shade the place during the day. And during the night, they fold away. And so the place can benefit from the cool sky and have some radiant cooling against the sky. So this is an image showing the, the plaza during the day. And now I'm going to show you um, the evaluation that we did behind this idea. So in the diagram on the left, you see the mean radiant temperature against the ambient temperature. And the blue dots are during the nighttime and the yellow one during the daytime. And this would be the MRT if you have no shading at all, let's say. So of course, during the daytime, you have really high radiant temperatures. And during the night, really low, because you have a cool sky above you, and the place can cool down. So now, if you have a shading, what, you, what happens is, of course, during the daytime, you improve the MRT a lot. But it's also you have a negative effect during the night because the shading blocks the pedestrian area from cooling down or cooling against the sky. So if I go back and forth, you see the blue dots. You can see that they are moving up because you lose the potential of the sky cooling. And this is why we um, proposed an operable shading. So next slide, where you benefit from both. During the daytime, you have the excellent shading. And during nighttime, you can cool the plaza against the sky. And you even, even the daytime, if I go another way, time back and forth, you see the yellow dots during the daytime, they go down. Because the place in the morning, it's cooled down, it starts colder than if there's just shading. And also in the night, in the evening, the, the plaza, it's, it's already not heated up by the sun, so it starts at a colder level and cool further down. But this is both times benefit from this operable shading and this excellent cooling source in what you see in, 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 hot, in some hot climates, not in all, but in especially in the desert climates. So 
bit about the modeling principles, how to evaluate model this outdoor comfort. It's basically the most important parameters you get from weather files. You know, you have beam radiation, diffuse radiation, sky temperature, ambient temperature, humidity, and wind speed. And you see the blue ones, they are controllable by passive design. So good design can influence, play around with these to get a good performance in outdoor comfort. And the red ones are more likely to be influenced by artificial design, by active design, like dry mist, for example. And these parameters, they are put into an environmental bot model, which is the wide area where we you run our simulation, like a simulation tools. And out of this, we get the parameters for the physiological model in the orange area, which is like the MRT temperature, humidities, and so on. This is what we need to calculate the UTCI. And um, at Transilla, we do this with the Transis simulation software 18 um, in this Rhino Grasshopper interface called Translizard. So it uh, can do a calculation in a detailed 3D model mode. And to evaluate what is happening in this outdoor comfort, in these outdoor areas, let's say. And this gives us the opportunity, for example, because we are talking about shading now, this gives us the opportunity to evaluate the performance of different shading materials and strategies um, in a model. So here you can see, for example, what we did for an Arabian country. We said, what's the influence of shading materials on mean radiant temperatures? Because it's often not clear how big the effect of shading or different shading materials is, and that there's a good shading and a bad shading, and that you can, there's a big difference what material you use. And this should somehow be analyzed in this, say, design day. So on the x axis, you see one day from midnight to midnight. And on the left axis, you see the temperature here, in this case, the MRT. And you see the orange line is the MRT if you have no shade. So if you're exposed to sun, then the MRT peaks at around 70, 72 degrees Celsius um, on this hot day. If you have now a membrane with 15% solar transmittance, then you can reduce, which is the green, like the dark green line. You can reduce the MRT of around 13 degrees in the peak hours. But this is not the best you can do. Because if you have no other options, like the gray one is a metal structure, and especially down here close to the red line, which is the air temperature, there is this green line, which is vegetation, so which always tends around being around air temperature, which I, which I showed already in the infrared images. And then there's a, we simulated a decoupled wooden structure. So this means we have two layers of shading on top, which is a layer which is exposed to sun. And then decoupled from this layer, there's another layer below, which is does not get a lot of heat transfer from the top layer. So it's decoupled. And it's also just tending around being around air temperature. And with these strategies, we can further reduce the MRT by another 15 degrees. So there's a, this has a big impact, of course, also on UTCI. And I show you another image from the Austrian pavilion in the expo where we just show, photographed the shading structure of the canopy, which is the artificial canopy on the left, which is um, around 40 degrees in the sun. And on the right, it's just turning around. This position was in the pavilion or in front of the pavilion. We um, took a photo of the vegetation, which was standing there, and you see it's around 30 degree surface temperature. Also, again, the sky temperature, the dark blue, is minus seven 
0.4. So here, great cooling source. But the important message of this picture is more there's a big difference how you design shading and what materials you select. So last but not least, frequently made mistakes. I want to um, show you why, what often happens, what goes wrong, what is maybe misinterpreted sometimes. And first, out of all, of course, air temperature is not comfort and air condition is not a strategy for outdoors. You see more and more in hot climates, especially that they put these chillers outside where which are really noisy, but the cool air which comes out of this device is just mostly blown away. So there are other, you have to uh, look for other strategies to create comfort that I just showed you. Secondly, uh, shading is not shading. There's good shading and or better performing shading and worse performing shading. So really, this is where it always starts that you have efficient shading where you should um, spend a lot of efforts in the details. And third out of all, it's um, do not copy strategies from different climates. It's also really important because this is a plaza in Paris. And we often see this kind of design as a, as a, as a role model for other climates. Because often also the architects and landscape architects, they come from these climates, Paris, Copenhagen or something. And they just copy this and put it into another climate. And of course, this doesn't work. This is a plaza which could be in Paris also, but it's in Dubai. And it's pretty empty because it's just too hot there. And it doesn't doesn't work like this, let's say. So um, I want to encourage you then, because outdoor creating outdoor comforts is also a chance to create unique auto identity, which reacts to this climate. And this is what you should do to uh, take the first step towards good auto comfort. So thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you did it well and got a bit of information and keen on your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a fantastic presentation. I think that frequently made mistake that you just talked about, it sums it up all very effectively and uh, really captures all the key ideas about uh, outdoor thermal comfort. So there are a lot of questions coming in and uh, we will jump right into it uh, in a second. Let me just all right so i'm going to start taking uh, the questions uh, one by one the first question is how much uh, which is a better metric utci or pet physiological equivalent temperature what was the second one? PET, which is uh, the acronym for Physiological Equivalent Temperature. Okay. Um, it depends, let's say. I, I know there are many metrics, and there's also this SCT and PMV and stuff like this, which can also sometimes be useful for evaluation of outdoor comfort. Um, there's not a really clear answer. We see that the UTCI is really um, good for for a very um, different range of climates. So you can calculate auto comfort from the Antarctic until the desert. But this compromises also sometimes in um, in the detail. Let's say that sometimes for specific climate, it lacks a bit of um, how detailed can be some parameters evaluated in terms of comfort. So I'm not sure about the PET in this case, but I know that 
UTCI is pretty much, you can first of all use it for no matter where you are. And in some climates, it could be that there are more precise evaluation methods. Especially we see it also, for example, in hot and hu humid climates, we often work with SET, which just gives us a bit more uh, better feeling for what is happening with, in terms of you add some elevated airspeed or something like this. So I'm, I'm not sure if the PT is, I think it's not covered, it's not covering as much as the UTCI, but it could be that it covers some specific climates more detailed. So I'm, I can't give a precise answer in this because I don't know the PET so well, but just to know what is, can explain the UTCI. Okay, next question. How much water and energy does a single misting system consume? How much does it cost? Yeah, that's a um, good question. For like we calculate one fan, if you have seen the fans, for example, at the Expo project, one of these fans needs um, in operation five liters per um, hour of water and has around 70, 60 to 70 watt power demand. So plus maybe another 60 watt for the high pressure system. So depends also a bit on the climate. Of course, in more hot and dry climates, you need a little bit more water, but this is the range and it's, it's not, if you sum it up, say per day or or per year, we often see that we do not, for example, in Arabian countries, we do not need much more water than the irrigation systems of, say, these comfort pools. Uh, and the energy, electric energy, of course, is much, much lower than uh, compared to conventional chillers. So we have a COP of around more than 20 in terms of how much energy we cooling performance we get out in terms of what we put in yeah. right next question is is there any alternate strategy for misting when the water availability is low and it's of course if it's if you have no water and it gets difficult to create the last boost. But as I showed, there are already the passive strategies, which um, do really a lot in terms of performance of comfort. And I think these can, the first step is always to maximize passive impact. And we can, could imagine that it always depends on the climate. So basically, I think there's no general answer, but that you can also play a bit more with thermal mass, operable shading, sky cooling. So it always depends where you are, what cooling potentials you have. And of course, the misting is always gives on top a little boost, but you can already create good conditions. And this should be the aim without active systems or so just with the passive design. But of course, in, in many climates, we see adding misting systems does another good performance increase. But if this is not available, then yeah, I would not never think of alternatives yeah. like air conditioning because yeah. this is not available, then I would go purely passive. Right. Uh, is there any thumb rule? Or how many fans uh, can be used in a particular square in a unit area? Um, typically, we say one fan covers around 10 to 15 square meters. So we should only use it focused on um, 
certain areas that you want to create some cool spots, not for a whole plaza, but it's it's not limited. I mean, it's depending on your design, on how big, how, how much area you want to treat with the systems. But it's a good idea to um, just supply it where you and focus local areas and do the surrounding still as good as possible. Right, next question. Can grey water be used for misting? Um, for this dry mist, we need um, treated water. So grey water can, if it's treated well, like we have to uh, get all chalk and stuff out of the water and we have an UV lamp which disinfies it and stuff like this. So there's some filters, of course. And why not? I mean, gray water, every water needs to be treated for the system a bit. So I guess gray water just needs different filters and should be fine. Depends on but how gray, say. Our next question, are there any um, open source free simulation tools for analyzing outdoor thermal comfort? Mm, I'm not sure about, I know that this, we have this, we, because we always calculated with transis, transis by itself is not free, but the plug-in, the grasshopper plugin is for free, and this could can be modified to simulate outdoor comfort. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe if grasshopper honeybee. There are many programs at the moment, the universities which develop such tools. Um, also standalone tools for outdoor comfort, but. I'm not sure if there's one already available for free and open source. So okay. maybe, but probably I can think that there, some years there's some, there are some. Right, a next question, can misting systems be powered by renewable energy? Yep, this is a good combination. Um, especially because always when you need cooling, you probably have a lot of sun. It goes well together. And as I said, the energy demand for fans and the high pressure system is um, very low. So should should also think of how you get the water. And um, if you can get the water in a sustainable way and with renewable energies, this would be also this is the second part of it. But yeah. Right. Next question: What is the influence of a solar PV and ETFE panels on MRT? The impact of a PV panel. I mean, I think we we had one slide where we saw the surface temperatures of PV system, they heat up pretty high to around 50 or more than 50 degrees Celsius, the PV panel by itself. So it would be a good idea to put another shading layer below, which is, um, so you don't get the radiation from the hot PV panel down to the pedestrians. Right. Next question. <clears throat> Does the transit model factor in evapotranspiration of vegetation? It does, but in a workaround, let's say, we do not, not yet model trees in a detailed evaporation uh, code, but we um, added and 
we see the cooling effect in the model and we see that this is a, has a really normally a really low effect um, because the evaporative effect of vegetation in a let's say if it's not a forest is pretty much blown away by the air pretty fast so you need a lot of vegetation to create an effect on air temperature just by green so it is can be modeled but it's also it should be taken into account that it's limited and one or some trees on an open plaza does not have an impact that you can measure you need really dense vegetation to create an effect with vegetation right. this is Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry? Uh, please go ahead. I, I think you wanted to complete your uh, sentence. Ah, uh, sorry. I just want this is, um, this should be considered when doing, when starting to think about modeling the evaporative effect of trees, which is really complicated in detail. It should be um, considered that this is if this has an effect. If if there's um if you model a forest or a really dense oasis with a lot of trees, maybe this makes then it's worth to dig into this effect. But if you just model an uh, open plaza or urban area with some trees, then um, it's often neg neg neglectable. The this the much bigger effect of trees happens due to their re surface temperature because the leaves, they tend around to be around surface, like around air temperature. And this improves the shading a lot. And this is much, the much bigger effect on comfort is, is the surface temperature, the reduced MRT at the end. Right. Next, next question, how can uh, people individually control their comfort outdoors? Individually, like, of course, there are the individual parameters, which is the clothing and the metabolic rate. So what you do and how you're clothed. And, and of course, you can move in like, select areas where comfort is better. Is this what sure this this is the answer that you wanted to hear this to this question? But I, I guess I think people I should guess. just move under a shade to make themselves comfortable. Yeah, yeah. You like your like your photos showed, you just move into the sun and that's how they take control. Yeah. Right. And uh, um, then the next question is, um, has Transolar worked on outdoor thermal comfort projects in coastal areas? And what were the broad strategies followed? In coastal India? Um, not, I personally do not know about the project on coastal India, but I know that we have worked in Hyderabad, which has finished another installation on an IT campus and while well, we had topics shading uh, performance and also installed some dry mist systems which could um, maybe potentially be visited I don't know but this yeah as far as I know not not directly in the coastal area or, or maybe coastal areas around the world and any other um, locations? The coastal areas, of course, yeah. We have, um, for example, Singapore, Abu Dhabi. We have one Cayman Islands and the Caribbean locations. And yeah, in Doha, which is also pretty humid. Yeah, there's some can be found on our homepage, I think. 
Great, that was the last question. Uh, thank you so much. There's one someone giving a feedback. Excellent presentation and graphics. I definitely agree. Can't. Uh, I mean, yeah. thank you so much. That really was a fantastic uh, presentation and very very insightful. Uh, a topic and so many things that we've learned about today in the webinar. Before we end the session today, uh, I have a few announcements to make. On 28th uh, of Feb, uh, February, we have the next webinar on metrics that matter. This is using metrics to make a business case for energy efficiency. Again, an interesting topic, presentation by Alok Deshmukh from Schneider Electric. Uh, make sure don't miss that one. If you, again, if you already don't know, we have a YouTube channel, NZEP India, where all the webinar recordings are available. And you can anytime go there and, you know, listen into the webinars that have been conducted in the past. Sign up for our monthly NZEP Times, the newsletter that goes out every month beginning of every month you can learn more about all our initiatives about net zero energy buildings and uh, can connect with us uh, if there is anything that you would like to uh, share or participate or maybe reach out to uh, your institution or organization the nzep website is your go-to place for all things nzep Sign up on the portal and join the NZEB Alliance. Um, you, it is a knowledge center as well. You have tons of information about um, uh, net zero energy building design, technology, policies, and as well as case studies. All the webinar summaries are also available on the website if you want to have a quick read about the topic that has been conducted in the past. And Finally, just an announcement. Uh, we are looking for a communications expert. If uh, you have a flair for writing and you love sustainability, then we are looking for you to join our team. You can write to us at careers at edsglobal.com. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Any questions or concerns or a feedback, you can write to us nzeb at edsglobal.com. And uh, I shall see you in the next session. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you.